great pleasure to be here. I think I was last here a couple of years ago also talking about a, a book. Um, so one of these days I'll have to come and just tell you about my actual research. Um, that will be fun too. So this evening I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, really the, the ideas behind this particular book called The Zoomable Universe, which is a heavily illustrated tour of everything we know, essentially. So it's, it's not too ambitious. Um, what I really want to focus on this evening, though, is more to do with the nature of reality. Also not a very ambitious thing to do on a cold evening in, in November. Um, the nature of reality, obviously, is something that humans have pondered for a very long time. And what I'm going to claim and try to show you through a number of steps this evening is that a very good entry point to thinking about the, the nature of reality is actually physical scale. It's something that we take for granted. Just even the concept that there is physical scale is something that we take for granted. But we live in this universe of three dimensions, and scale is actually a property of each of those dimensions. Scale, or distance, or length is a fundamental property of, of x, y, and z, the three dimensions that we live in. And it gives us an entry point to talk about the nature of reality. And, and humans have understood this for quite a long time. In fact, this is a, an image uh, showing a page from a book uh, published in 1665 by the English scientist Robert Hooke. It was a book called Micrographia. And it was actually the first best-selling science book. And in Micrographia, what Robert Hooke did was use the new technology at that time of the microscope. And he illustrated this book with these incredibly detailed drawings of all the things that were sitting under people's noses, fleas being fairly abundant in the 1600s, from what I understand. Um, and people were amazed, <clears throat> because this was the first time that they could see that something like a flea, so diminutive, has incredible detail, has incredible complexity. It is its own little universe right under our noses. And of course, as time has gone by, we've, we've gone further. We can now uh, look at scales on, uh, we can, <laughs> I have to make sure I'm not repeating, we can look at scales on scales, but no, no, no. We, we can look at things from even external to the, unit, to the Earth, <clears throat> and we can zoom in, and now when we look at objects on the Earth and animals, and we eventually get back to some kind of insect life, it doesn't seem so remarkable anymore. But it's really, really useful. It's really, really important. And since this is part of an astronomy society, I thought I'd show this. One of the things about taking a journey through scale, because scale we can take a journey through. We can think about big things, and then we can think about progressively smaller things, think about small things and progressively bigger things. The real thing about a journey through scale, which is in part what the book is about, is not necessarily the highway that you're traveling down, right? Most highways are not very interesting. The interesting stuff lies on the sides. It's the stuff you pass by. It's the stuff you, you glance at as you go by. Um, so let's take an image of our Milky Way galaxy. Now, I'm cheating a little bit because we're not really traveling in scale here in the true physical sense. We're, we're sort of magnifying an image, but it gives you the same idea. What starts as a little blur of light off to the side from the plane of our Milky Way galaxy itself resolves into a, another entire galaxy, in this case, the Andromeda galaxy. This data, this imagery is patched together from various instruments. What you're looking at now is actually Hubble Space Telescope data. And as we zoom further and further into this little thing that was off on the side, we realize that it, too, is composed of stars. The Andromeda galaxy contains perhaps as many as a trillion other stars. Like I say, this is cheating a little bit. We're not moving through physical scale in quite the way that I'm going to talk about. But it's, it's illustrative of the fact that you notice things as you zoom in to the world. And I think more than anything, physical scale is just fascinating. Again, it's something we tend to take for granted. But if you step back and think about it for a moment, here on Earth, there are organisms separated by as much as two orders of magnitude physical scale, which are nonetheless capable in some way of perceiving that the other organism is probably also a living thing. 
So the whale and the mouse, if you could put them together in a room, and I wouldn't advise that, I suspect it would end up in a, in a bit of a mess, but the whale and the mouse have some capacity for being aware that the other, even though it's a hundred times larger, is still a, a living thing. And scale really gives us an entry point to thinking about the connections between physical phenomena. So this is now getting to the real science, getting to the, the questions about where does stuff come from in the universe? How does it cycle around? What are the cycles of matter and energy in the universe? And what are the big questions? What are the big unanswered things in our understanding of the universe? So I talked a lot about scales, but now let me put some numbers to it. So I'm going to claim that we exist in a universe where there are roughly 63 orders of magnitude of physical scale that are in principle accessible to us. That we can either see directly or explore or um, infer from examining the nature of matter or the nature of the cosmos around it. So let's look at all of those physical scales. I don't know why those numbers, you see there are certain numbers that just disappear in there and I don't know why they're disappearing. There we go, okay. So here they are. So what was up here, which I just replaced with cosmic horizon was 10 to the power of 27 meters. So what we're looking at is scientific notation in units of meters of the 63 factors of 10, orders of magnitude, physical scale that I'm going to claim are in principle accessible to us. This is reality that spans these 63 orders of magnitude of scale. Let's think about the extremes. So at the large end, the 10 to the power of 27 meters, we have what I'd call the cosmic horizon. So that is the, the span of the universe defined by the furthest places from which light has had time to reach us in the last 13.8 billion years, which is our best estimate at the moment for the age of the universe, 13.8 billion years since the Big Bang. And so light that has just managed to reach us today defines the extent of our possible measurement or knowledge of the physical universe, 10 to the 27 meters. At the other extreme, at 10 to the minus 35 meters, which is pretty extraordinary. A proton, just for comparison, is about 10 to the minus 15 meters across. So 10 to the minus 35 meters, it's another factor of, of 20 orders of magnitude smaller. It's the Planck scale. And the Planck scale right now is the smallest meaningful scale for our physics, our understanding of physics. And it's a place where uh, current models of physics, our current models of the world, kind of break down. To really understand the Planck scale, what we're going to need is a, a melding of quantum mechanics and gravity. We don't quite have that yet. It's the scale of strings and superstrings and, and stuff like that in particle physics. So let's look at all of these scales in a slightly different way. We can actually put them out on a, on a line. So this is actually a graphic from the book. So at the center here, is the Planck scale, 10 to the minus 35 meters. And now I've laid all the scales out on a linear graph. We can slide up in scale to that boundary between the knowable and what is presently unknowable. That is the 10 to the 27 meter cosmic horizon. Beyond that is unknowable because light hasn't got to us from there yet. Now, we come back for a moment and take a look in the middle there is the span of scales that are typical of human experience. A typical human experience spans maybe three to four orders of magnitude of physical scale. Obviously, using technology, we can probe beyond that. But the reason for showing you this is it's rather interesting where it lands in amongst those 10 to the 63 orders of magnitude of scale. Because where it lands, it's actually very close to the midpoint. So in a logarithmic sense, the midpoint is around a tenth of a millimeter. So what do I mean by that? Well, there are as many orders of magnitude of scale smaller than that midpoint as there are larger. Okay. Now, is there anything particularly special about the fact that we land close to that? 
trample? Probably not, um, but it is useful to land roughly in the midway point of all possible scales of the physical universe, because it allows us to both look inwards and to look outwards. We're kind of perched at the right place to look in both directions. And one of the things that we find, and it's something you've, you've probably heard before, but I think, again, we tend to forget, so I want to look at it for a moment, is that if you look outwards, there's a lot of emptiness. If you look inwards, there's a lot of emptiness. There's a lot of space in between the stuff that matters to us, the things we're made of. So I thought I'd play a little game with this, and to get there, I'm going to just take a quick journey in scale. So let's start at that 10 to the 27 meter cosmic horizon. So this is obviously an artist's impression of the cosmic horizon, the 10 to the 27 meter scale. So it's a, a spherical surface. And we know that if you could look at the universe on this scale, you would see a distribution of matter that is not exactly random. It has structure to it. It's this web-like texture. That web-like texture, although it's on enormous scales now, we think began with tiny, tiny microscopic quantum fluctuations, quantum variations, when the universe itself was tiny and at the scale where quantum mechanics applies 13.8 billion years ago. So let's just dive through. Let's go down to 10 to the 26 meters. We still see some of that scale. We also see these brighter points in there. Let's go a little bit further. What we're looking at is really the condensation of matter, matter that has drawn together because of gravity over the last 13.8 billion years. I'll go one further. So now we're down to 10 to the 24 meters. So we've already jumped three orders of magnitude here. Every point of light essentially corresponds to an individual galaxy, individual galaxy of stars, which may contain billions and billions, hundreds of billions, maybe even trillions of stars at this scale. So let's keep going. <clears throat> Bit of emptiness. Maybe you can start to see something in the middle there. Then by 10 to the 22 meters, you start to recognize some things. Here's a galaxy. This is, in fact, the Milky Way galaxy, if you could see it in this kind of format. And actually, it doesn't take much. By 10 to the 21, which is not many steps away from 10 to the 27 meters, we see the span of our Milky Way galaxy. This is as imagined seen from the surface of some rogue planet in orbit around our galaxy and the outer periphery of our galaxy. Our galaxy spans roughly 100,000 light years, depicted like this. And you're seeing the light of stars and gas and reflected light of dust and other things in our galaxy. But what you find is that it amounts to a teeny tiny bit of the observable universe. So our galaxy really doesn't contain much of the observable universe at all. And if we look deeper in our galaxy, we also find it, too, is kind of empty. So I've said that a couple of times. Let me sort of give you some evidence for the emptiness of things in the universe. Because I think scale leads us to why almost everything is merely nothing. If anyone knows what that beetle is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I like your jokes. Yes, OK. You've got the joke. <laughs> That's a nice picture. So let me do a thought experiment for you. So it will seem kind of trivial, but I think it's actually it's quite, it's quite, uh, it has quite an impact. Let's, let's do a thought experiment. Let's just play a game. Say that there are 200 billion suns in our galaxy, that, that structure I just called the Milky Way. Okay. What if I was some godlike alien and I decided to gather up all those stars and put them in a box? How big would that box be? Now, physics will make that difficult, because if I gather that many stars together, their self-gravity will cause more to collapse together into a massive black hole. That's OK. <laughs> We're just doing a thought experiment. We can do this. We're literally just asking, what volume could contain all the stars in our galaxy. In other words, all that condensed matter, matter condenses down into these bright little points that we call stars. How much space does that actually take up? So we're going to put them all in a cube. The answer is pretty remarkable. So the answer is the cube would be about 10 to the 13 meters on a side. 
So that may not be terribly meaningful, but let me put it another way. That would fit easily inside the orbit of the planet Neptune in our solar system. So in other words, you could take every star in our galaxy, put them all next to each other, line them up in a lattice like in this box, and it would easily fit inside our solar system. That, I hope, gives you a little bit of a sense of just how much emptiness there is out there. Right? It's extraordinary. And believe me, I, I have to run the number several times just to convince myself, because it seems so ridiculous, but it's true. Let's just finish this off by being a little more ambitious and asking what fraction of the universe's volume actually contains stars. So the observable universe, defined by the cosmic horizon, all 10 to the 27 meters of it, how many, you know, how many stars is that and what volume would they fit into? Well, estimating the number of stars in the universe is a little tricky, so I'm going to be conservative in the sense I'm going to make it more difficult for me to pack them into a small box. Now, you will have heard estimates of the number of um, galaxies in the universe. That, uh, you know, people will say, well, it's maybe 200 billion galaxies in the observable universe. There are estimates that suggest it could be as many as a couple of trillion galaxies. So I'll take that because I'm trying to make life difficult for myself. And let's imagine that all two trillion galaxies in the observable universe have a similar number of stars to the Milky Way galaxy. Well, I won't bore you with going through the details, but if I made another cube of all of those stars, it would now be about 10 to the 27 meters on a side. So it's definitely bigger, which is good. It's actually only about 10 light years per side. A light year is about 6 trillion miles. But what volume is that compared to the total volume of the observable universe? Well, the total observable universe is about 4 times 10 to the 32 cubic light years, which means that all the stars in the universe fit into a volume that is about 0.00000 3 times 10 to the minus 30th of the total volume of the universe. So this trend of emptiness continues. So, I, you know, this is actually really pretty astonishing. All the stuff that we can actually see, the bright stars, which is matter condensed into little, little points, takes up a minuscule amount of the total volume of the universe. I mean, I was thinking about how else to describe this. If someone you know, gave you, I don't know, a donut and said, well, 3 times 10 to the minus 30th of that donut is cyanide, You'd still eat it, right? Because 3 times 10 to the minus 30 is nothing. It's almost equivalent to nothing for us. So all that we hold dear in the universe, all the stuff that we can see, all the bright stuff, is basically nothing, which makes it a strange sort of universe. OK. Let's go a little further. So now we've established that all of this is nothing. <laughs> Just about. Let's zoom a little further. So let's drop down in scale, 10 to the 20 meters, 10 to the 19 meters, 10 to the 18 meters. We're in interstellar space. Then around 10 to the 17 meters, again about 10 light years across. Here we are, and this is us, that point of light, that star in the middle. And an obvious question is, well, how did the universe get to be this way? OK, so you know, maybe. There isn't so much normal matter in the universe, but how did it end up so compact, so condensed? Because we think 13.8 billion years ago, it wasn't. It was smeared all over the place. It was just atoms permeating the void. So somehow it's got more condensed, and it's got really condensed. So that gets us to the next piece of this. And again, it's, it's all being initiated by thinking about scale. So I'd like to understand how this came to be. Well, to do that, what I actually have to do is look at this scene but five billion years ago. Okay, so that's you five billion years ago. Well, it's not. You're, you're somewhere in there, let's say, smeared over about a light year in distance. Okay, so all of, the, all of the atoms in this room used to be smeared across a volume about a light year across five billion years ago, literally. So it's entirely possible that you know, an atom in that wall and an atom in that wall have never been as close as they are now before in the entire history of the universe. So what happens? What turns this, which is a, a nebula, a cloud of gas and dust, into that highly condensed thing we call the sun and its planets? Well, very, very briefly, 
roughly five billion years ago, part of that nebula was sufficiently cold and dense that it began to fall in on itself, it began to collapse. Its own gravity started to pull it together, and make it denser and denser and denser over time. It happened pretty quickly. This, this whole process doesn't take long, a few million years to get going. And as we look closer and closer and time is ticking away, you can't quite see it in there, but as gravity pulls stuff together, you make a protostar. That protostar is, starts to spin because matter falling together tends to increase the, the rate of spin. As it becomes uh, more and more compact, it drives energetic jets. It does all sorts of messy, nasty things. And really only about 10 to 30 million years later we end up with something much more familiar, a forming planetary system. We have a young star in the center there surrounded by a disk of orbiting matter out of which planets are condensing. And as they condense, they carve grooves in this protoplanetary disk. It's a really quick process. At most 30 million years for our solar system. And then we get to this our familiar solar system. What I'm showing here are the orbits of the innermost planets of the solar system. Okay. So all right, so that's part of this process of compacting matter in the universe. But this now is going to lead us to the next question. Because what I'm going to tell you is that the solar system is peculiar. I think actually when I was here before, I was talking a little bit about this. And I'm going to extend on what I talked about a couple of years ago. So what on earth do I mean by that? Well, put simply, there's been a revolution in astronomy of the last 20 years, which is the discovery of planets around other stars, the discovery of other planetary systems. And as I'll show you, those discoveries are telling us something really interesting about ourselves, as much as they're telling us interesting things about other worlds. So the first piece of this is to appreciate just how many planets are out there. Okay, so another little crazy thought experiment or game just to, to give you the sense of scale here. We can ask how many planets does the galaxy make? All right, so we'll see if this works. It's kind of silly. Imagine an HD TV frame. I know ordinary old HD TV is kind of passe and now we've all got 4K TVs or whatever, you know. Um, but an HD TV frame has about 2 million pixels in it, and it can produce something that looks really like that. Beautiful, crisp, high fidelity image that's made of about 2 million pixels. Now imagine 100,000 TVs, 100,000 of those frames. It's not that, it's not even that, it's kind of more like that. Well, in terms of planets, how many planets are on our Milky Way galaxy, it turns out that our solar system is represented by just one pixel out of 200 billion. Basically, every star in our galaxy has planets around it. So imagine we're one teeny little pixel within one of these teeny little screens, and all the other teeny little pixels each represent a separate planetary system in our galaxy. That's how many worlds are out there. Now, we haven't found them all yet. That'd be lovely, but we haven't found them all yet. But we have found a few thousand and partly because they're so incredibly abundant. And finally, those few thousand let us ask questions that we've never been able to ask before. Now, this is the most technical thing I have to show you this evening, so I'll, I'll talk about it. It's not really technical, but it, it is the most technical thing compared to everything else. Um, it allows us to ask very specific questions about our context, about you know, where do we stand? How often do planetary systems like ours occur. So let me talk you through this. This is one example. So what's plotted here in this kind of infographic, each open circle represents a real exoplanet, something that we've, we've detected and we've made some measurements of. And <coughs> they've been thrown down on this graph as if they were all around a single star. And what we've done is take the true orbital distance of each of these planets from their star and scale it according to the size of their star so that we can compare them all together. So it's kind of a fair comparison. Okay, so they're placed as far from this central star in proportion as they really are from their star. And then you can also see plotted on here are the orbits of the inner planets of our solar system. 
So there's Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Now, there are two things to tell you about this. The first is that there is some observational bias here. It's much easier for us right now to find planets that are close to their parent stars for a variety of, of reasons to do with the t detection techniques. So in that sense, that's part of why there are so many in here close to the star. But that's insufficient to explain the other observation here, which is if our solar system were more typical, it should have several major planets between Mercury and the Sun. And it doesn't. This is really beyond just this plot. You can do this quantitatively and statistically. We don't have those inner worlds. A great majority of stars harbor planetary systems, which include planets on much closer orbits to their parent stars. Now, on that basis alone, it's already apparent that our solar system doesn't quite fit the mold. It's not average. It's not typical. We go a bit further, and we can look at things like the particular types of planets in our solar system compared to the types of planets that we see around other stars. We can include the fact that we have a star of particular size, which actually puts it in a minority. Most stars are much smaller than the sun, and so on. And I think when I was here a couple of years ago and talked a little bit about this, I was being very conservative. And I said, well, I think our solar system is a one in a hundred place. Well, I've revised that to one in a thousand, and that's actually still being conservative. There are astronomers out there who will tell you the solar system, just based on its architecture and makeup, is a one in 30,000 place. I'm not quite ready to say that yet, but I'm kind of gratified that what I suspected turns out to be true. So what does this mean? That's the next big piece of this. Well, any time you see something that says we live in an unusual part of the universe, you have to ask whether that unusualness is related to the fact that there's life here. So something about this unusual solar system that predisposes it towards generating life perhaps even generating intelligence. What, you know, there's some, is there something going on here? So it's a refinement of the Copernican principle, if you will. So how do we answer that? Well, it's tricky, because to really answer that, we need to understand where life comes from. And we don't actually have a particularly good picture of that yet. What we need to answer is something like this. What enables evolvable, novel, living states to infect an environment. And I use the word infect deliberately. I mean, we used to talk about, well, how can, how can life happen on a planet? How can a planet make life? I think we, in, sci in the scientific field studying this, we're moving towards seeing life as a catalytic phenomena, as an infectious phenomena, as a very, very persistent infectious phenomena. It's, it has infected the Earth for at least four billion years. And it's gone through phases where most of it was wiped out, and then it all came back again. So it's very persistent. But to link life to the architecture of our solar system is quite a tall order. We need to understand this, and I'm not sure that we do understand it. We also need to understand the Earth, probably much better than we do. And I'll give you two silly little sort of thought experiment type examples to illustrate how little we in fact understand about the basic function and characteristics of our own planet. So imagine here's Earth and Mars. Okay? And you know that 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in ocean. Right? That amounts to a surface area of our planet about two and a half times the total surface area of Mars. Now I would argue that the surface area of Mars is much more accessible to us than stuff in our oceans, and especially the bottom of our oceans. We can't scrape off everything and look at our planet like this. The bottom of the world's oceans are largely unexplored, even today. And it's not that we're going to find some mysterious sea creature necessarily, although maybe we will. It's more that that's a big piece of our planet that we don't have immediate access to. It's two and a half planets worth of stuff that we can't readily get to. That seems problematic if we're going to understand 
how it is this environment gave rise to life and how it's allowed life to persist or infect for so long. We also are kind of cut off from the interior of our own planet. So we might try to understand how the magnetic field of the Earth is generated using supercomputer models like this. And we have magnetic field lines generated by some assumed rotating conductive material deep inside the Earth to make our magnetic field. But we can't get down there to truly confirm that this is the correct picture. And even a sort of high school picture of the Earth as this onion, right? I mean, I know I grew up thinking that the Earth has, you know, it's got the core, it's got the mantle, it's got the crust, it's like this onion, right? And it's sort of like that, but it's actually much more complex. And the Earth is a glob of still molten stuff, right? And the only frozen bit is the crust that we live on. The rest is still in a molten, movable form. And it turns out that on very long time scales, hundreds of millions of years, it's, it's bubbly around. It's like a giant lava lamp right, inside the Earth. But we only have indirect information about that. And I'm not trying to make this depressing, but I'm going to be telling you all the things we don't know. Right? But that's because that's the most interesting stuff in science. <laughs> it's the stuff we don't know, all the stuff we're even only barely aware that we don't know. That's where the fun happens. That's where the action is. So now I'm going to say this, and it is part of this trip in scale, we have to move down in scale and say, well, here's this other dirty little secret in science right now, is we, we don't really understand what life is. We don't actually have a single working, agreed upon scientific definition of this thing we call life. And we can all look at these pictures and say, well, there's a, a fancy looking plant, there's a baby elephant, these things are alive. But I guarantee if you take 100 scientists and put them in a room and ask each of them, give me a definition of life, you'll get a different answer each time. We haven't quite figured it out. There's something about this phenomena that is slippery. It's tricky to pin down. It gets even more complicated for other reasons. So for example, on the lower left here is a picture of a piece of high temperature superconducting material levitating in a magnetic field. That particular compound may not exist anywhere else in the universe because it was designed and produced by a human mind. And we didn't dig it up from somewhere. It was, it was manufactured, it was constructed. We also do things like this. We build cities, we build all sorts of structures, complex structures that almost have a life of their own. Right? People talk about cities as systems, as almost as living things. Life is tricky, slippery, complicated. And when we get to the question of intelligence, it's even more so. So we do another silly little thought experiment just to drive some of this home again. Life is complex. Okay. So just to, again, get us to think about this. And the answer is kind of up there, but let me talk. So suppose I can extract all of the DNA in your body. So I'm going to have to put you in a blender, I'm afraid and do some, do some chemistry on you. But if I could put all of your cells together and extract the DNA out of each and every cell in your body, the DNA in, in one single cell in your body, if you could stretch it out as a single straight polymer, would reach for about 1.8 meters in length. If I could put all of those together in a line, it would actually reach for 74 billion kilometers which is 193,000 times further than the distance between the Earth and the Moon. That's just you, your DNA, right? And, and again, I had to check these numbers a few times, because the first time I did it, I thought, that's ridiculous, but it's not. It's true if you could do that. Part of what I'm trying to emphasize is how much is packed into how little space again. Right? We eliminated all this empty space, and we packed all this stuff together. That's just why we're at it. Um, what about all humans? So I'm going to put all humans in a blender. Some people would say that's not a bad idea. <coughs> Get all of their DNA and stretch it end to end. It would reach for 58 million light years, which is a substantial fraction of the observable universe. So now we're back up on scales of 10 to the 25, 10 to the 26 meters. So the point of that rather silly little thought experiment is just to emphasize how much potential information is packed inside your DNA. And of course, the DNA in each of your cells is essentially a duplicate of each other. 
But nonetheless, that's a lot of complexity. It's a lot of information. And someone told me as well, apparently when I showed this somewhere, someone said, oh, yeah, why use humans? Use viruses. If you do their, their genetic code, it would stretch for 200 million light years. Because we're really in a planet of viruses and smaller things than us. So life is complex. <clears throat> and what about intelligence and consciousness? Well, you know, things like microbes, we don't think are intelligent or conscious in the way that we are, but they certainly have agency. They can actually make decisions, this thing called quorum sensing in bacteria, where, where as groups they make decisions. There's swarm intelligence, for sure. When you put together lots of simple organisms, their behavior changes on a larger scale. And arguably, we're a type of swarm intelligence. All our little cells are working together as a unit and doing things that individuals just don't do. And then the questions about the, the human mind. So if we're to understand life in its entirety, we kind of have to understand all of this stuff. And then intelligence and consciousness are interesting too because we have to ask, are we missing something really important? I mean this in a pure scientific sense, not in some metaphysical or spiritual sense. I mean, in a pure scientific sense. Are we missing something really important? Now, I didn't include in this talk discussion of fundamental physics. There are elements of fundamental physics that are still largely um, unresolved. Let's put it that way. I'm being very polite. I'm not saying some fundamental physics is total nonsense, but there are a lot of unresolved questions. We talk about superstring theory and quantum mechanics, but we don't understand a lot of that. So are we missing something really important in particular that would help us understand where life comes from, what it really is, and how it might connect to our apparent cosmic unusualness on larger scales? Well, of course, a question like this is essentially impossible to answer. But we can certainly think about it, and I'm going to also give you a hint that where I think a solution might lie. So for example, you know, one way to to step back for a moment and say, well, imagine I was some intelligent squid-like creature a billion light years away. This is me here. Um, giving a lecture like this. You know, it would undoubtedly be a different story. I might be talking about physical scale, but I'd be telling you about different things. I'd be telling you about different puzzles, different things that we did or didn't understand. So a lot of what is a barrier to our understanding comes from chance and contingency in our own evolution and the fundamental nature of our intelligence and consciousness, our perception of the world, our perception of reality. It's really hard to see beyond that. Someone also said to me recently in science, you can often tell when there's going to be a revolution because there's something that doesn't feel quite right and nobody can quite put their finger on it. There's some element of some field where like, well, we all sort of assume this, but we don't really know. And that's usually where the magic is going to come from. It's usually where the next discovery is going to come from. But it's really difficult to predict. But let me tell you the last I have like two more slides about something that is happening now that you've undoubtedly heard of, but you may not have heard of in, in a scientific sense, which is right now something really interesting is going on for our species, which is that we're learning about new ways to think. So I have up here a picture of the game Go. Maybe Go players in the room. It's an ancient game. It has relatively simple rules, but extremely complex strategies to play it well. And the interesting thing is, you may have heard that we now have deep learning AI systems, so-called artificial intelligence systems, that can do better than the best human player at Go. And the really interesting thing about these, these systems or these algorithms is that the good ones teach themselves. They used to use you know, history of human games to, to teach themselves how to play, um, but they can now just teach themselves. And they do it by essentially playing themselves millions of times to find good strategies. So for certain very specific cognitive tasks, we have, now have machines like Go, Go playing machines and some other things too that do better than us. They exceed us for very specific cognitive tasks. And um, oh, I, I also just put this up. They don't look like that, right? But this is the sort of imagery that you know, if you're a corporation investing heavily in AI, you put this up and everyone goes, oh, yeah, they must be doing something good. I can, I can tell you most of the time it's just really ordinary. 
Um, but these algorithms are extraordinarily capable. One of the most telling things is if you talk to the highest ranked Go players in the world who have played against these machines and lost, and ask them, well, what was it like? They say, it was like playing an alien. It really was. It, it was not like playing a human. The algorithm deployed strategies that were almost unfathomable. Couldn't understand what it was doing. Why would it make that move until you know, a little while later it beat you? The algorithm has found ways of playing this ancient game that no human has found in 2,000 years. It's done, some of these algorithms train themselves in like days. Okay. In science, this is really interesting, and it's starting to become a tool in modern science, in particular for the kinds of questions I was raising, because life is a complex system. Right? We know some of the fundamental rules. We know the rules of how you know, one molecule interacts with another molecule, but turning that into a description of life is beyond us. But it may not be beyond some of these deep learning algorithmic approaches to forming a cognitive, um, a cognitive recipe for, for the world. So it's conceivable that some of our scientific questions are going to be addressable, not with our minds, but with the minds that we build in the future. I think that's really interesting. I'm almost out of time. I have one last slide to say, to show you. Um, I hope in this brief period I've shown you a little bit of the simple entry point of thinking about scale leads you through this, this sort of rabbit hole of ideas to some really deep, deep questions about the nature of reality. And I'll just end with this. Um, so kind of paraphrasing something Einstein said, he once said that the most extraordinary thing about the universe is that it can be understood, even if just a little bit. Well, I actually think this needs to be modified. Really, the most extraordinary thing is that it can be understood by itself. 13.8 billion years ago, your atoms were smeared across the light year of the universe, formless. And yet, here they are today, aware of that fact. That's pretty remarkable. Thank you. So I don't know if we have time for questions or? Yeah, we do. I think we have a little time. Um, back when you were on the whole slide on how our sports is and the whole thing about uh, planets being really large and close to their stars, how, this is probably a different question, but how exactly do you rule out the observational bias of that? Because, long, because when you have gas giants in long orbits like our like, for example, Jupiter and Saturn, you have to be observing them at a very particular time. They confirm them usually with one multiple observations, but we simply haven't been looking for exoplanets long enough for something with the period of Jupiter, which is like 10 years, to have gone around its star more than once for something like capital to detect. Yeah, so there's... How do you rule out that bias? There's an excellent question. So, as I mentioned, you know, the bias is definitely there, but we've looked at so many planetary systems that what we see, even if there are planets on longer period orbits that we haven't yet found because of the challenges you mentioned, those systems are more typically going to have all of these planets still on orbits close to the parent star, kind of orbits that we don't see in our own solar system. So there may be that all of the planetary systems I showed you also have gas giants on longer orbits that we just haven't seen. Those could be in the same configuration or same basic architecture as our solar system. Um, but that doesn't get around the fact that so many stars have planets on short period orbits. So it's actually at a point where even if you're just biased against those, we've actually you know, looked at a substantial fraction of the planetary population so that we can actually say this is significant. You're absolutely right. There are biases, and to put hard numbers to this is a little tricky. So you have to understand all those things to do with um, the, the cadence needed to, to spot these long period plants and so on. But I think it's, it's true to say, even with that, this still holds, just because there are so many of these planets on these short orbits, it just overwhelms even the, the observational bias. But it's a really excellent question. Yes? What about the 
phenomena? Yeah, so, well, so golden, the Goldilocks zone, or its phenomena is often called, it refers to a thing that astronomers tend to call the, the circumstellar habitable zone. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if you have a star and a planet, and it's a planet that could be like the Earth, we think that it has to orbit that star within a certain range of distances in order to possibly have a temperate environment. So if it's too close, the star gets too hot, too far away from the star gets too cold. And one of the gauges we use is whether or not liquid water could exist on that planet's surface. Now, it's very crude as an estimate of, of whether a planet is good or bad for harboring life, but it's a starting point. <clears throat> so um, we have to assume that there's an atmosphere and we have to assume there's water. And the focus on liquid water is because liquid water is such a fundamental piece of terrestrial biochemistry. You know, water is an incredible solvent. Right? I mean, all the water we experience is heavily contaminated. Right? When you drink, you know, if I drink this, right, it's, it's lovely clean water, thank you for providing that, but it's actually, it's full of dissolved stuff. Um, if you have ultra pure water, which they use in the semiconductor industry, they also use it in physics, you don't want to drink it because it will dissolve your, your intestinal, your, your, your gut, your throat. Um, ultra pure water is incredibly good at dissolving things because water is an amazing solvent. And on a molecular scale, that's really important for the functioning of life as we understand it. Water also, on a planetary level, plays a role in climate regulation plays a role on sort of short-term climate regulation. You know, water can evaporate. And when it evaporates, it soaks up a lot of heat, right? To evaporate water, you, you've got to pump in energy. When it freezes out, it releases, um, it releases heat. And it plays a, a central role in long-term climate stability because of a thing called the carbon silicate cycle. It's the weathering of rocks, and taking CO2 out of the atmosphere as carbonic acid and, and planting it in the bottom of the oceans, basically. So, so that's a complicated answer to your question. But the Goldilocks zone, we think is that somewhere, if any given star, there's going to be some set of orbits around the star, not too close, not too distant, where the odds are better for the possibility <coughs> of life as we understand it, if you've got the right kind of planet there. Um, and actually, just to mention, um, sorry, I'll get to uh, some of the research I've been doing uh, with a graduate student at Columbia is, is refining that, and we've been, been looking at the rotation of planets. So it turns out if you change the day length of the Earth, you change where it really is in the Goldilocks zone. And in <coughs> fact, we're not quite at the best rotation rate. If we were rotating a little bit slower, the Earth might be even more suitable for life. Uh, you mentioned that the, the definition of life is something that's really, really <coughs> and something that's really hard to come by. Um, do you worry that possibly that the nature of language, language itself may make it impossible to apply such a thing? One example is that if you look at the history of any species, it's impossible to come down like at one point it became a new species. Every mutation, you can't say that well, this mutation made a new species. It's kind of like Do you think it may be used to just the nature of language itself? That's a really excellent question. Um, yeah, I think, yes. I mean, so perhaps this is what you're referring to, right? We're really, for whatever reason, as humans, we really love to put things in categories <coughs> and make sharp distinctions. Like, right? you know, that's, that's a rat, that's not a rat, that's a human, that's not, you know. And at some level, especially when we're talking about evolution, as you mentioned, just, you know, how do you, right, this distinction of one species from another historically was just on how it looked, right? And so there are all sorts of mistakes made if you look at, compared to looking at the genetics of different organisms. Um, so I think our language is, it is embedded with this desire to categorize things. And it may be that some phenomena are continua and they're also so complex that it doesn't actually, what really makes sense is the interconnection of a phenomena with all sorts of other phenomena. And that's something certainly I think, yeah, I think English certainly is bad at that. Um, I mean, other languages, <coughs> other human languages may be better. Um, I don't know if that really answers. Yeah, it's, no. it's, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really deep point. <laughs> Something at the back, someone at the back. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Sure. Can, uh, can you think, can you um, talk about the possibility that these non-human or these these super gold players, uh, mechanical gold players, could become so autonomous and strong in themselves that they could not only beat us at go, but decide to dispense with us <laughs> entirely. Yeah, so again, great question. Obviously, this is something that there's a fair amount of discussion about at the moment because of you know, the anticipation that these algorithms, these, these deep learning systems, will get better and better and better. You know, I'm, I'm less concerned about any of those algorithms becoming sort of fully autonomous in the sense that you're talking about and deciding. You know, so a, a so-called artificial general intelligence, which is what you're talking about, I think is a long way off. I don't think we know how to make that. I don't think we know how to evolve an algorithm towards that. That's something that, that has its own awareness, that makes decisions, has its agency. I, I'd actually be more concerned with the fact that these algorithms and these deep learning systems are so good at duping us, right? Fake news. You can now make videos of you saying that you believe that the world is a cube or that the earth is flat and it looks like you doing that but it's not it's a machine construction it's because these algorithms are so good at assembling large amounts of data and making uh, sense of the correlations between that data that they can then use that to create something new on demand so I'm, i'd be much i'm personally much more concerned about the simpler <coughs> ais being used as tools to manipulate humans by other humans rather than the AIs turning around and, and deciding that we're irrelevant. I mean, How some... Can, do we, can we always pull the plug on them? <laughs> I would hope so. Don't, don't buy Facebook shares. I'm sorry, if anyone works for Facebook, I didn't say that. <laughs> yes? It seems unintuitive that at least in the classical sense that anything can't be more divisible. So is there a good analogy to understand why um, at the Planck scale uh, our, our understanding of things break down completely? Um, why is it that at six point something something to the negative 34 we can't just say let's cut it one more time and that's the end of it? Um, hmm, yes, that's <laughs> a good question. Well I think the thing is, we don't have a use. We don't have a framework for describing something if we cut it more. So it's at a point where, you know, at the Planck scale, we think that it's a scale where the underlying fabric of space-time is itself kind of choppy and uncertain. Right? So it's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle written into the fabric of space-time. Right? So you can have virtual uh, black holes popping up and, and disappearing again on these tiny, tiny scales. So you know, this is a little bit out of my comfort zone, but I think the answer is we just don't have a set of rules that we can apply. We know that at that point, our physics doesn't tell us anything more. And so even the concept of scale breaks down. So scale relies on having a firm foundation of space time, at least in the Einsteinian view of things. And at that scale, we don't have that anymore. Geometry, as we understand it, doesn't work. So that's my kind of hand wavy <laughs> response to that. Those questions are important. I have two questions. Uh, first one is kind of related to what he asked. Uh, do we know or can there be any object or matter exist without an intrinsic mass? And second, it's a uh, can you explain uh, gravitational wave? How do we measure the velocity of it? Can we, can we measure the velocity? OK. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. So can something exist without? Well, <laughs> yes and no. Yeah, so I mean, a, a photon has, well, it has energy. It has momentum. We don't say it has mass, but it has those other properties which we otherwise associate with mass. I think that's about as close as you get to something. But, but even that, 
right? Momentum, like photons have momentum, right? So photons exert pressure if you bounce them off something, um, which we tend to associate with mass, but you know, a photon in principle has zero mass. Um, the other question, so the gravitational wave question, so theoretically they propagate at speed of light, and I think, uh, you know, so the current detections of gravitational waves by the LIGO experiment, uh, I think confirm that as far as we can tell. So, you know, so the LIGO observatory has different geographic locations, so for those of you who don't follow this, so LIGO is this extraordinary experiment that can actually detect ripples in, in space sent out by, for example, merging black holes, emerging neutron stars, which literally, as they spiral together, send ripples out in the fabric of space. They, they essentially put uh, a shear in, in the geometry of, of space-time. And we can sense those passing through us using these observatories, which are these enormous structures with four kilometer long arms where you fire laser beam back and forth, and you can actually measure tiny changes in the length of those four kilometers of arm, four, four kilometer arms corresponding to the passage of gravitational waves. Um, and I should say it's gravitational waves. Gravity waves refers to another phenomenon, which are things you see in the sky, like cloud structures and so on. Um, so there are different observatories. There's one in Hanford, Washington State. There's one down in Louisiana. Um, there is, there's one um, coming online in India. I think there's a bit of one in Italy, maybe. So the, when a gravity wave, gravitational wave comes through, you can time it. Okay, you can tell. Okay, hit Hanford before it hit Louisiana. And we know how far apart that is. And as far as I know, it's all entirely consistent with those, those waves traveling at speed of light, which is what you would expect. The phenomena that you're looking at don't always produce electromagnetic radiation, so it's hard to, to make that um, assessment. But we did see last year um, merging neutron stars, which did make electromagnetic radiation and gravitational waves. And my understanding is there was no lag between seeing the thing in a telescope and measuring the gravitational waves. So I'm overly complicating the answer. They travel at the speed of light, <laughs> as far as we know. Actually, my first question I would like to rephrase it: like, do we know any other matter except photon of light that exists without this mass? Without mass? Yeah. Um, well, there are there are subatomic particle species that by themselves don't have mass. They have mass because of their interaction with the Higgs field. That's why the Higgs boson is so interesting and important. Um, but I fear if I go too far on that, I'm going to say the wrong thing. <laughs> so, yeah. What assumption did you use for the number of cells in a human being? Um, in, in measuring the DNA? Yeah, I think, uh, what did I use? I, it was something like, I think it was of the order of somewhere between 10 and 100 trillion cells, something like that, which I think is about right. I mean, estimates vary, because it's not <coughs> such an easy thing to actually pin down, but it's of that order, which is why you get such enormous numbers. So I think one more question. Anyone <coughs> yes. Um, you mentioned the current thinking on the possibility of other intelligence, what kind of real evidence is there as opposed to speculation? Um, <laughs> I don't think there's any evidence yet. Uh, so, but, but maybe to answer your question in a sideways fashion, something interesting is going on that you're back in the 1980s, right, the whole search for extraterrestrial intelligence as a, as a scientific discipline kind of got into a mess, right? Money with, with, was withdrawn from it, NASA didn't fund it anymore, and so on. Um, there's been a resurgence of genuine scientific work being done on this, in part because of people like Yuri Milner, the billionaire who gave money to this Breakthrough Listen project to expand um, SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And there's been some nice work done recently showing just how tiny a bit of the 
possible search space we've actually looked at so far. And the bottom line is there could actually be lots of intelligent civilizations out there. We simply have not looked enough. I mean, we've literally I've forgotten the analogy is something like you know, a cup of tea compared to a planet, it's oceans. That's actually quantitatively how far we've managed to look or how, how much we've managed to look. So NASA has actually now agreed to start funding some more work on this. It's also been driven by the realization that some of the tools we use to look at exoplanets could actually show us signs of complex, large structures built by other civilizations out there in the galaxy, so-called mega structures around stars and so on. So I, I think the answer is, I have no idea. <laughs> but what is interesting is it's come back right now as a reasonably respectable scientific pursuit, which I think is a very positive thing, because we don't know. Right? So to not look at all would be kind of crazy. Sorry, that's not, not a full answer. Anyway.